Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this uh, session today, where we have uh, the pleasure of having to uh, Thomas Sharon to give us a presentation on the depth of the research report. So um, well, uh, as we get started, uh, please remember to turn off your cell phones and all buzzing devices. Um, so for many of you guys here uh, who already know Toma well, uh, welcome back to Google. <laughs> for those of you guys who don't know uh, Toma, well, he used to be a senior user experience researcher here at Google, um, working on the fourth floor of this building. <laughs> That's when I got to know him. Um, so Toma today uh, is a thought leader in the field of uh, user experience design and research, uh, working as uh, vice president and head for head of user experience at uh, WeWork, which is this uh, startup that has thousands of locations worldwide, uh, in which uh, Toma leads this team that designs work and living spaces, communities and services around the world at WeWork. So uh, there's also a, a desk uh, at the back of the room where uh, copies of the most recent book written by Toma is on sale. <laughs> so he's the author of uh, two books, Validating Product um, Ideas Through Lean User Research, that is on sale. Uh, also the author of a less recent book, uh, It's Our Research, which I've read and enjoyed a lot. Uh, and both books have uh, so-called actually helped to increase the adoption of user experience uh, research among product teams worldwide. Um, yeah, so uh, this is how we're going to do uh, today's session. So first, we would have Tomo up here uh, giving a presentation for about 20 minutes. And then uh, we would transition to a file chat uh, discussion format between me and him. I have some prepared questions for him that I hope will be the same questions that you guys have for his presentation. And then after that, we would open up uh, the session to Q&A from the audience. Um, is that OK? OK, great. And then when we get to audience Q&A, I would just request that everybody step up to the mics on the uh, both sides of the room so that uh, the questions that you raise can be heard by the rest of the room. It can also be recorded. Uh, yeah, and, hope, uh, and we'll leave enough time so that uh, you guys can check out copies of his books at the desk later, which comes with a Google subsidized price. OK, so with that, uh, well, welcome, Toma. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be back, and it's great to see some uh, familiar faces. So when I joined WeWork about close to two years ago, I asked this question, how do you decide what to work on? And the answer to the question, uh, the answer that I got is pretty much on our walls and our, on our people's t-shirts, do what you love. Um, what we're trying to do right from the, the get-go at WeWork is try and come up with something that helps people understand that passion, do what you love, is not necessarily the only way to decide what to work on. So we added, we created this diagram, and we added human needs and ability. So let me explain. Passion is do what you love. You think a product, a feature is really cool. You're really passionate about doing that, uh, so you just do it. That's how many companies decide what to work on. We also added ability. Can you even do that, that thing that you want to do? And, um, and let's say that passion and ability, sometimes you see a lot of companies decide based on ability as well. Uh, and then what we wanted to add that was completely missing at WeWork was considering human needs. Do people actually need that thing that you're thinking of? And it has to be what you see here. It has to be a combination of all three, because if it's only a combination between passion and need, then um, it's fantasy. You can't, it's a flying car. You can't, really, you can't really do it. If it's a combination between need and ability, then it's just work nine to five. There's no passion there. And uh, forgive me, art lovers, but if it's a combination between ability and passion, then it's art. Uh, it's not really needed, but uh, it's there. We're doing that anyway. So this is, this is how, uh, how we started. A couple of words about WeWork. Uh, WeWork is a company on a mission. This is the company mission to create a world where people work to make a life, not just a living. Um, these are current WeWork cities. Um, I think we are in uh, 50 cities at the moment with uh, over 160 locations. And, uh, and we're growing. We're opening. Uh, about 10, between 10 and 20 buildings once, uh, once every month. Um, 
we work building we work is is selling its customers we call them members um, space community and services so our spaces are known to be really really beautiful a really warm environment that invites people to collaborate we have a lot of events that are going on uh, throughout the day and over weekends sometimes. And we also provide our, our members with a lot of services, uh, a lot of digital products to support meaningful connections between our members, and also um, uh, apps and so on and so forth uh, to connect them. Services include uh, health insurance if they want and, and, and probably hundreds of other uh, different services. This is my group's mission, design delightful experiences for our members through data-informed human understanding. And here's the challenge with WeWork. So think about, let's say, uh, I don't know, Steve Jobs. Um, he had a relatively easy job. If he wanted to understand the user experience of Apple products, he could have said, for most of them, bring me all of Apple's products to the table in front of me. I want to touch them. I want to feel them. I want to give you feedback. This guy, this is our co-founder and CEO, Adam Newman, uh, he can't do that <laughs> because our buildings are everywhere. Uh, we're opening in more and more far away locations. And it's really, really hard to understand what is the user experience, what is our members' ex experience. So from here, I jump to, to the research that we do. And here are three problems that we see with research uh, in companies. Uh, happens here too, happens in probably every company that does research. So first is bad memory. We have bad research memory. Um, let me know if this scenario sounds familiar. Are there researchers here? I know there are some. So researchers, you don't have to say yes, but smile if it's true. Um, you want to do a research activity, some kind of a study, and then you just before you start planning, you're thinking to yourself, hmm, Maybe somebody else did it already, so let me ask. So you send an email to all of the researchers in your group, maybe in your product area, maybe all researchers at Google, and then uh, you ask, did somebody do research about X, whatever it is that you're interested in? And sure enough, by the end of the day, you get responses. Um, I remember back in the day, it could go up to 10 responses from people who say, yes, we worked on something exactly like that a couple of years ago. You don't get 10 responses for people who completely forgot they did it maybe five years ago. And then um, you're a nice person, so you summarize everything you read. You send back to everybody. I see some smiles, so I know it's true, still true. Um, and then you decide to do the study anyway. Because yours is a little bit different, and you want to learn something a little bit different, so you decide to do that anyway. So we have bad research memories. The second problem is silos. Researchers are not the only ones who are doing research in a company. Marketing is doing research. Product managers, whether they call it research or not, they are talking with a lot of users all the time, and so on and so forth. If you have a, if you have a call center, they don't do research, but sometimes they issue reports about the top 10 problems that they're facing, uh, that, that people are calling them about. This is also uh, a silo where this data is saved. So a lot of um, departments are doing research. Everybody's happy to share, but there's no one place to make sense out of all of that. And my pet peeve reports. Um, I'm pretty sure, although I, I, I remember some exceptions here at Google, I'm pretty sure that there's not one person on the face of this earth that wakes up in the morning saying, I'm going to read a report today. Um, and being a researcher for many years, I don't even like to write them. And uh, I think reports are not what I call the atomic unit of a research insight. Again, researchers would tell you that you go into a research study, study and you have a short list of questions you want to answer. Those are the research questions. And then research is life. You look at life, and life uh, looks at you back and say, 
I have more answers than uh, your questions. So you find out more than what you intended to find. And then there's the report. So you are, as a researcher, you have a dilemma. Should I report answers to the research questions that we were interested in? Uh, or should I report that plus a lot of other information that I found? Uh, there's no rule about that, so any researcher does whatever they think is right. Uh, in any case, reports are not really atomic. There's a report that might include a piece of information that has nothing to do with the reason for running this uh, specific research study, and yet it's an important insight that might serve people in the future, but it's buried in the report. So I'm aware of this, these problems for many years, and uh, as soon as I joined WeWork and was asked to start a group from scratch, there was not a lot of research going on there at the time, um, I thought this is an opportunity to maybe solve all of these problems with this system that we called Polaris. So Polaris uh, is a way for, um, I call it democratize the user experience. Uh, I, I published a Medium post about that and somebody responded saying, you're not really democratizing. Why do you call it democratizing user experience? You just, it's just a research archive. So yes, it is a research archive, but uh, this, uh, the research archive is the, uh, the output. Democracy for user experience is the outcome, and that's really important. What's happening with Polaris is very interesting. Um, First of all, Polaris is a system that gathers all of the research that, uh, that is being done at WeWork, and it gathers that in a different, very different atomic unit than a report. I'll get to that in a second. In any case, Polaris is helping um, anyone at WeWork who is designing anything, who is building anything, who is affecting the member experience to prioritize their work, and I'll give you an example for that very shortly, um, to educate themselves. I know um, that teams at WeWork, as teams here, and again, researchers would, would know what I'm talking about, are not waiting for anyone. They're not waiting for a researcher or for a report or for a study to end to decide what to do or to decide what to work on. That said, they are happy to learn and educate themselves about what they decided to do already. So Polaris is a system that helps educate these teams about what they're working on. And lastly, if by any chance there's a team who's looking for a project, Polaris can help allocate or assign teams with different projects. All right. When I talked about the atomic unit of a research insight, this is, this is it. Uh, we call it a research nugget. And uh, we just celebrated a, a, a little while ago uh, 5,000 nuggets entered to Polaris in a chicken nugget uh, meal. Um, so what's a nugget? A nugget is a tagged observation supported by evidence. Okay? Tagged observation supported by evidence. I'll explain. Observation. So observation is something that we learned during a study. We saw something. We understood something. We understood why it happened. This is an observation. So we just type it down. This is what we found, and this is what explains it. Evidence. There has to be. There's no nugget. Nothing enters Polaris without evidence. It's not about the opinion of anyone. There has to be evidence, proof that the observation is true. Is true. That could be um, a short video clip. It could be 10 seconds. It could be a minute, something like that. It could be a photo. It could be a screenshot of an email. It could be a document. It could be whatever it is, whatever media, but proof and evidence to that what we said in the observation is uh, actually what happened. And lastly, and that's what makes Polaris um, uh, useful and special, is a series of tags. The first thing we did when we designed Polaris was create a long taxonomy of tags, how we tag things, how we tag nuggets uh, within that system. So these could be um, tags that are pretty, uh, pretty much demographic. Uh, so which city, the name of the location, uh, the size of the company, and so on, that, that the person is representing, and so on and so forth. 
but they could, there are also tags that relate to the experience. So is this observation a positive one, neutral, or negative? Is this, um, what is the magnitude of that? What is the frequency? And so on and so forth. Um, I call them the three C's, three things that people can, uh, can do in Polaris when they go into the system. They can create nuggets, all right? They can um, search for different nuggets on the different topics and, and, um, and create playlists from these nuggets. They can, and this is how it looks like. So you see uh, an interview here. So we just decide on the clip. Uh, what is the what is the length and the the minute the second that it starts and ends, uh, and that would be the evidence if that's a, an interview. You see uh, middle left. You see uh, an empty box for typing down the observation, uh, and on the right and bottom left you see some of the tags uh, that we're using. Um, we tag by journey. We tag by emotions, objects, and uh, the experience metrics that I just, just described. And then uh, you can also cure it. You can add and create uh, playlist nuggets to playlists, um, and you can share these with other people at WeWork. Uh, this is how a playlist uh, look li looks like. Um, you might suspect I worked here for a while. Um, so uh, what you see, uh, obviously the video is uh, the evidence. Just below it, you see other members squatting, blah, blah, blah. That's the observation. And some of the tags on the right-hand side, on the bottom uh, right-hand side. And on the right is the playlist itself, the different nuggets that compile and create uh, the playlist. You can see that you have nine nuggets there that will take you five, about five minutes to watch, and so on. People can consume, um, consume these uh, nuggets and playlists. I compared that to uh, healthy food. At first, uh, they don't really like it, but it's good for them, so they have to. Um, and in time, they understand that this is useful, and they use it more and more. We see very interesting um, usage scenarios uh, tracking what's happening behind the scenes. Um, we see people who are, uh, let's say, there's a designer, interior designer, that designed um, a conference room at WeWork. So that person is looking for uh, feedback about conference room. Uh, we see people in, building, in a building. We saw somebody in a building in Chicago watching all 200 nuggets related to that building in Chicago, uh, and so on and so forth. We've seen teams uh, making decisions, roadmap decisions about their products based on what they find in Polaris. I want to give an example for that. Um, so to become a WeWork member, uh, you usually take a tour. You take a tour, you go through the building you're interested in, uh, they show you different things, and then you decide if you want to join or not. Uh, we also serve coffee at WeWork. Uh, so let's say you are the general manager of WeWork in Europe, and you want to see, um, you want to get feedback about tours you want to understand the situation about tours and coffee. What's more important? You search for negative um, tours in Amsterdam, or sorry, in Europe, um, and then you might get uh, this results, 72 nuggets in the playlist. And when you search for coffee negative in Europe, you get three nuggets. That alone, without even watching the, the playlist, that alone tells you that there might be a bigger challenge there with tours rather than coffee. So your focus should be on, on uh, understanding what's happening with tours. I want to show you a quick um, video of how it looks like and sounds like. So uh, we also serve beer. So here's uh, some feedback about beer. Whoops. Okay, so you first, this is how you start the search. You search, these are, we call them props. So beer is a prop. Uh, you search, you select a location. If you're interested in some other filters, 
you apply them. If not, you move on and you get the results as a, as a playlist. You can save it. I have a very creative uh, name for it, this, uh, very creative description. And let's listen to a couple of, uh, of nuggets. Uh, I mean, I love having it as an available option when you are doing a crazy unit at six o'clock and you go for a beer, just sit down and have a beer and talk creative stuff. And that's amazing, right? That's a phenomenal part. But not everybody likes beer, though, or the fact of having beer in an office. Internet was noisy. And then I think, you know, not everybody's 20. So if I'm having people come up and, you know, it, yeah, it's a cool space and everything, but, you know, having kids drink beer and all that crap is fine. But I think there's a whole other niche for a little bit more sophisticated uh, mm -hmm. opportunities for people in that, in that sector of the business. Right. So this is how it looks like and sounds like. I obviously picked the uh, audio not to expose uh, the identity of those people. Um, you can also watch a list, um, a playlist as a list, not just as, a, as a videos or photos. And, well, of course. No, no, no. Sorry about that. All right, um, and to sum it up, this is the vision for Polaris because this is not the end. What, what Polaris, before I show you that, what Polaris is doing is tell you, uh, tell us, we work employees, uh, why things are happening. Our vision is also to provide a system that tells us, that explains what is happening. So we want to provide a score for everything at WeWork, a quantitative score. And then from that score, lead to a, a Polaris playlist. So for example, beer. Um, let's say beer is scoring uh, worldwide. There's, uh, the score is 44% out of 100. And you want to understand, as the person who's responsible for beer at WeWork, you want to understand uh, why the score is so low. Then you can get, um, get to Polaris and see a, a, a playlist of people talking about um, about beer. The way we do that is by collecting, for example, satisfaction feedback uh, through these little devices that we created on the top left, and we put them everywhere uh, in the building um, through surveys and through an app. Uh, we call this the Yay app. Uh, through an app that our teams in the buildings uh, pull out and ask people to rate uh, different things uh, that are happening around them. So this is uh, how people can understand both what is happening and then understand why it's happening. Uh, I couldn't help it, but uh, if, if you're interested, this is, a, this is another research project um, that we completed at WeWork. We found that a lot of people don't show up to tours because they uh, can't find the entrance to the building. So this is how we, uh, how we solved it, so you can read about it there. And I think we are done. Yeah, slide. Blah, 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 blah. Bottom, this deck, if you're interested. And second to last, if you want to start it on your own, just check it out and see if this is something that you can do. We created a, an Airtable template uh, for Polaris for designing your own Polaris. So feel free to, um, to use it. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to explain this. And uh, I was not expecting to have templates that we could use to um, start putting together something like this together. So, um, well, so some questions for you. So, uh, if we have to think about you know Polaris and, and all these processes from the con uh, the, the producers and for start, uh, it seems to me that there's a bit of this asymmetry where uh, the people who are trying to put all these nuggets into the system are the guys who are putting in all the hard work so that the consumers could actually benefit from this. So, um, 
So, I mean, so in your experience, what have been some of the, you know, the, the so-called more uh, successful ways to actually incentivize more people in the organization to create uh, and archive these nuggets? So at this point, I would say we are kind of uh, control freaks about uh, what's go what goes in uh, Polaris. Outside the UX team, not a lot of people can, can add nuggets to Polaris. Uh, there are exceptions, though. The exceptions are a team that asked us specifically to train them on. It's actually a, it's kind of a hidden way of training teams on how to do their own research. They want to add things to Polaris, and we say, you know what? Let's train you on how to do research. You'll do research, and then we'll also train you on how to add nuggets to the system, and then, and then they do that. So we so far trained two uh, different teams. Sometimes there's a person that is, you know, an individual that's interested personally in, in doing that. We train them as well. Mm -hmm. oh. But not everyone is, is, uh, has access to do that. Okay, great. That's interesting. And that actually leads me to the next question, uh, you know, because you were talking about all these things about observations versus evidence. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, what does it actually take to train someone, you know, to, to actually uh, so-called frame and enter something that is acceptable as a piece of evidence? Uh, we have conversations within the UX team about many things related uh -huh. to Polaris, specifically about that as well. It really depends. If you don't say anything, some people would write down an observation and then choose as evidence the exact same words that the person in the interview is saying, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so we ask them and train them to kind of add some more context by you know, extending the time that they uh, include as evidence. Uh, sometimes it's not just a, a recording. Sometimes it's a photo. And support that with a photo that better explains or provides evidence to what you were just saying. Um, it's not easy. Um, we have a lot of conversations about the quality, what qualifies as a great mm -hmm. nugget, and so on. We also have a term, uh, kind of internal term, it, you, you don't see it in the system, we call it the golden nugget. Mm -hmm. A golden nugget is a nugget that uh, is so special <laughs> that uh, you learn something really important from it, it's really actionable, it's something, that you say, you, it's like a headbanger, it's like, oh man, we have to oh. do something about that. Um, How many percent of your nuggets are the golden nuggets? Uh, very few. <laughs> very, very few. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I was wondering, you know, because, yeah, it, it's, there is a certain uh, threshold that uh, a piece of evidence needs to meet. So, um, so were there situations when, you know, there might be uh, employees who actually disagree about the evidence that go into a nugget, or sometimes the fact that the evidence might be okay in itself, but it's not yeah. relevant to the observation? So what, do you guys what I'm going to say didn't happen yet. We didn't mm -hmm. implement this, but this is something that we're working on. Um, as we train new people on adding uh, nuggets and evidence mm -hmm. to, to Polaris, uh, we want to create different roles of people. And then if you are a, a mm -hmm. kind of a newbie uh, nuggetizer, we call it, then, uh, then somebody will have to review and approve your maybe first 100 nuggets. So there's another eye that looks at things. Uh, it's not just you. So we hope to somehow compensate for uh, things that don't count as evidence, for example. Okay. Yeah, and then, uh, well, as you mentioned, you know, the, the nugget is the most atomic unit of research yep. findings. But sometimes uh, consumers don't really want uh, to, to get a finding at that level of, of granularity. They want something like a higher level theme that integrates and synthesizes many different nuggets. So do you guys provide any support for that right now? Yes. Uh, we create, we also create and curate playlists. Hmm. So these are UX crea uh, curated playlists and we share them with teams. So we kind of do their work. We have a way to, it's like, in a way it's like a report, but it's a playlist with uh, maybe a few more words about it, some analysis into mm -hmm. what is it that you're, you're seeing in the playlist and so on. So we do that. Um, and, and sometimes we train others to do that as well. Yeah. yeah, okay. So now switching over to the consumer side of things. Um, so what have you guys found to be the types and characteristics of research nuggets that were more useful to consumers? So I, I touched it a little bit earlier. Um, sometimes nuggets, and these are, it's not the nuggets, it's the people who enter them, uh, they just, in an observation, they just describe what mm -hmm. happened. Uh, that's not really not not really useful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the person said that 
beer is having beer in an office is is not a good idea. That's not enough as as a nugget. We we want to understand why, or they held. Let me maybe describe something more uh, meaningful. Um, the member said that they're taking meetings in a coffee shop rather than in our conference rooms. Interesting, but still, it's not a nugget because we don't understand why. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they add the why, for example, they do that because we work is too noisy. Then we have something that we can do something about. So uh, this is meaningful. This is something that hints that there's a problem there. And we know what the problem is. And if we search for noise and ser- if it's tagged by noise and conference rooms, and if we search for that for a list like that in Polaris and see, I don't know, 120 nuggets, we know we have a problem there that we need to do something about. Uh, so these nuggets must be um, kind of a unit, an atomic unit. And it's not an atomic unit if, if it doesn't have that why. OK, got it. Yeah, so some broader questions now, because my uh, understanding and impression about um, Polaris when watching our presentation is that uh, there's always a tension in computing systems between pull and push mechanisms. Uh, Polaris seems to be something that's more pull driven. Yep. Uh, and, you know, if, well, what might be some opportunities to think about supporting more push mechanisms? So currently we have a manual push mechanism. <laughs> we, uh-huh. we push playlists to people. Uh-huh. Uh, we heard you've been working on mm-hmm. ordering beer for WeWork. Here's a playlist of, of people, uh, members from all over the mm-hmm. world, talking about beer. Uh, that's very manual. Um, one other thing that, uh, that's a feature kind of on, on, our, on our roadmap um, is... Uh, updating you as somebody who either showed some kind of interest in a playlist, either you created it or it was shared with you. Um, Each time there's a new nugget that is being Mm -hmm. added to the list and it's being added automatically because of the tags, you'll get a notification about Mm -hmm. that. And then we hope that this will encourage people to try it out more. Mm, that's a great idea. You know, and since you're talking about tagging, um, I was wondering when you guys were designing Polaris, uh, besides the tagging approach, were there any other uh, considerations that you guys considered for other approaches to organizing the nuggets? Uh, no, not really. Um, the only thing we were not sure of, we it, it was very clear for us that this was an investment. So mm-hmm. we wanted to be sure that this is working before we kind of make that investment. So we created that template that I shared. We created everything uh, with Airtable, um, stored everything on uh, the, the re- video recordings on YouTube, stored audio recordings on SoundCloud, and that was our system. Um, as soon as we saw the reaction to it, um, we decided, OK, this is worthwhile, and then we invested mm. the time in um, changing all of that to a system that we can control and, mm-hmm. and okay. access. It makes total sense to me. Um, well, what are some of the challenges to scaling something like Polaris, and what are you guys doing about that? Um, so I would say there are two challenges that are kind of related. Mm-hmm. One is that it needs to be something that, that people at WeWork are aware of. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. if they're not aware of it, obviously they're not going to use it. And the other challenge is once they're aware and they search for something, they have to see, I don't know if you noticed the dates, they have to see nuggets that are relatively new. Mm. Otherwise, they think it's an old uh, database of, of information and they're not going to do anything about it. Although, uh, we all know that sometimes, uh, even if you found something a year or two ago, it doesn't mean that it's old. It doesn't, doesn't mean that it's not true, but that's how people treat it. So we, our challenge is to keep it fresh. Um, and these are <laughs> big, okay. big challenges, because to keep it fresh, it means that more people need to uh, do research and nuggetize that um, more and more. And that's something that we don't always have uh, time to do. And awareness is, is, again, always a challenge. We need to push and, and talk about it and mention it in every meeting. When somebody asks us a question, we shouldn't just answer. We should say, and that's what we try and do and remember ourselves to do, have you checked out Polaris? Do you know what Polaris mm-hmm. is? Maybe show them, and then mm-hmm. they start using it on their own. Yeah, I mean, do you guys have, I mean, uh, at a system level, do you actually 
have, have a way to designate certain of those nuggets as golden nuggets so that nope. they <laughs> surface. It's just a uh, jargon between okay. us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what are some of the considerations around uh, personally identifiable information? I mean, I saw that you guys had to, uh, you know, just black out the faces. But that's that's others. only for the presentation, but oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a, that's a challenge. I mean, we cover the identity mm -hmm. uh, of the person itself. So the member, the company name is not it, it's it's uh, kind of uh, encrypted throughout a, mm -hmm. a code, and uh, the same for the the person's name. We don't even add it to the system. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that said, if you are our people in the buildings are called community teams. If you're a community manager and you see a video of a member from your building, you would know them. <laughs> Even though you have a 1,000 members, you would know them. Mm -hmm. So we are always concerned with people taking it the wrong way, especially if the feedback or the nugget is talking about you, the community manager. Uh, so we ask the people we talk with not to mention names. Mm -hmm. So just say, so we say, for example, if you have feedback about uh, your community manager, use that term. My community manager don't use a name. Mm -hmm. um, they don't always follow instructions, but we try. Uh, what do you guys do about the evidence if they don't follow instructions? Uh, so it's, it's, it's something we have okay. to cut and, 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 and not include. Because mm -hmm. that's uh, we don't want people to use it as, you know, I saw you saying something bad about me. Why are you doing that? Um, that's always a challenge. But at least the name and the company name, they're not included in Polaris. They can't, mm -hmm. they can't see that. OK. Yeah, so going, I think, to more broader uh, organizational-wide issues, I mean, what do you see as some of the necessary conditions that need to be in place for organizations to actually adopt your ideas around Polaris effectively? Um, honestly, uh, I, I, I couldn't care less. I mean. <laughs> It's, it's really, honestly, I, I'll tell you that when I described Polaris to important people at WeWork, I was asked not to do it before we did it. Um, this is something that uh, I'm sure all the researchers here are um, not foreign to the problems that I described. Uh, this is, these are problems that are happening for many years in many companies, and it was very clear to us that this is something that WeWork would benefit from. So... If the company is doing research or is beginning to do research, it, it's relevant. Other considerations, I mm -hmm. think everything is solvable. Mm -hmm. We have challenges with making people aware of it, but that's mm -hmm. something we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. This is what the company needs. This is the healthy food. They need it, although it's not tasty at first. OK, well, um, so do you know of any other organizations that have already adopted your ideas around Polaris? Uh, since we made it public, a lot of companies c uh, contacted us. Uh, I don't really know if they implemented it, but um, all of Google's competitors uh, <laughs> kept in touch. Uh, uh, I, I, I have no idea if, if they did okay. something about it, but there is interest. I, I don't really know. Wow. OK. And are you saying that as a way to encourage us to try to adopt some of these ideas? I'll be honest. I tried here, but uh, I didn't get a lot of traction. Um, I think what you see here is, uh, and we talked about it earlier, you see research archives. Mm -hmm. And these research archives that you see here are archives that you can just upload your report and uh, maybe tagging. I can't remember. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, tags. Um, I, I think it's not enough. It's not, it's not atomic enough. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when you're tagging, you're, not, you're thinking about the entire study. You're thinking about the entire report. The reports are long, include many things, many insights, as I described earlier, and so on. So I would say... Uh, no, you don't have it, and um, maybe it's an opportunity. Okay. Well, uh, so we have 15 minutes left, and I just want to make sure that members of the audience get to ask any questions that you guys have. So we have mics on the two ends of the uh, room. Feel free to just step out and ask your questions so that the rest of the uh, room can hear your questions. Okay. I'm in an organization that loves research reports, and I'd love to know a little bit, besides just developing a tool, how you weaned people off of their dependency on reports. Why do they love the reports? I'm sure they don't love because reports. They love the yeah, research. It's because it's known. It's, their, like, fami it's the familiar way that they're used to digest. You're talking about the researchers or, or uh, the no, consumers of research? Consumers of research, internal, internal clients of research. 
I, I, to me, the biggest insult as a researcher is when people read a report and they say, hmm, interesting. Um, I want it to be actionable. And um, I think that if you track and see, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, <laughs> grill you here. But are they doing anything with these res research reports? If the answer is no, or not really, or not, you know, what you expected, then uh, I would say don't listen to what they say about reports. Look at their behavior, as you know, and uh, treat them as users. Treat this as a design challenge, and see what you can do about it. Polaris is not the only answer, I'm sure. Uh, it's just one possible answer. If reports work for them and you're happy and they're happy, don't wind them off of that. <laughs> okay. Hey. Thanks, Samir, for your presentation. I think it's super interesting. And of course, as researcher, I'm always looking for any tool that can help us not only capture feedback, but also communicate it with my stakeholders. I noticed one of the images that you had, that you have like a device, a physical device yes. in one of the phone rooms. Yes. So two questions. Yeah. One is, um, how does it work? How is it connected to Polaris? And second, why using a physical device instead of sending a survey to your, um, to the consumers? Very, very, very good question. So um, the product that is WeWork is, has many, many details, many, many things that create it. Um, we think it's hundreds of, hundreds of things. It's the beer, and it's the, the chairs, and it's the, the, the wallpaper, and the events, and the community team, and so many other things. It doesn't make any sense to ask about 500 things in a survey. Uh, nobody would complete it. Um, that's one reason we don't uh, solely use surveys for, uh, for these uh, quantitative measurements. Um, we also know that, especially for physical things and objects and spaces, the best way to collect feedback is there, in context. So imagine a, a conference room. So you booked a conference room. Let's say the next time you book a conference room, you, you have a pop-up question on your screen that asks you, uh, how was your recent experience with the conference room you just um, you used maybe five days ago? Uh, we have that. But we learned from members that in many cases, first, they don't remember <laughs> how was the experience. Uh, and two, they, uh, the person who is booking the room is not necessarily the person who is using it. So the feedback is very biased. So in context is the best, because we know you're there. We know you just use the room. Give us your feedback, and that's it. That said, it's not connected to Polaris. Uh, this is a different system that gathers all this data about uh, scoring different spaces and other things. And then you get a score for different things and locations and regions and so on. From there, we take that and we link that with a relevant Polaris, or we would. That's not connected yet. That's the vision connect that to uh, Polaris playlist, as I said. So if you see the data about beer is, is flowing to uh, and creating that score in a dashboard somewhere, uh, and then that score, you'll have a link next to it that will connect you to a playlist about beer uh, in Polaris. And these devices are based on, uh, we created them. It's, uh, these are uh, Amazon dash buttons, and the casing is something we designed. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that reports sometimes will do is give you the background of the research that mm -hmm. happens and action items that happen afterwards. How do you see your tool taking into account when significant change or impact has already come from the nuggets that exist? So that's the democracy I'm talking about. I'm almost eliminating the researcher from the equation here. I want the person who is watching, creating the playlist, watching it, and deciding what to do next I want them to create that for themselves. They decide, they know what happened before, they know about the background, and they know what they can learn from what they just saw. The researcher is there to help them. I want, my, my idea is that everyone's a researcher. I want everyone to do that. Currently, we're kind of in a transition mode where uh, researchers and other UX people are uh, contributing or adding nuggets to Polaris, but as the consumer of it, let's say, 
a, um, let's equate it to what's happening here, a product manager or an engineering team or, or whoever is deciding uh, something about a product, I see them as the ones that almost write these for themselves. It doesn't have to be in writing, it has to be an understanding that they have, what they know, what this, uh, what this can help them with, uh, what decisions they can take based on that, and so on. There's no, that's, that's exactly the democracy I, I talked about. Um, it's not, or, you know, at least when we use Polaris, the way I'm describing it, uh, those decisions are not in the hands of um, researchers to write and report. This is in the hands of consumers, people who are actually deciding what to do with the products. One quick follow-up. I guess how yeah. do you prevent duplicate research from happening at, around or at the same time? So say if a community manager in Chicago goes through some nuggets and on beer and decides to take action based on those nuggets and then a community manager here does the same thing, does it duplicate the work or do you think they're just building on top of each other? So when it comes to what we call consumables, beer, coffee, and so on, it's not that every building is deciding, not always. Every building is deciding, deciding what to buy. It's being centralized, so it's not really about them. Uh, but if two different people decide to improve the member experience, that's a good thing. That didn't happen before, so that's a good thing. I don't see that as a problem. Consistency is not necessarily a must always. Hi, I actually had a similar question. Just to follow up, so I'm curious, are, can those community managers actually track that so they're aware of what's happening and what's Tra Track what? The outcomes or actions taken based on the nuggets. Uh, not in Polaris, no. So you can't necessarily see how someone else... Okay, no. Do you no. think that's important or no? Um, I think WeWork has a lot of systems in place for, uh, for doing that. We're not trying... I think it's important. We're not trying to solve that with, with Polaris. Okay. We thought about kind of... We thought about adding a feature which was there for maybe two minutes and then we removed it of kind of allowing uh, people who use a certain playlist that indicates a certain problem to raise their hand digitally in the system as people who want to be a part of a team that solves the problem. <coughs> um, but then we were afraid that Polaris is going to be, become a kind of a, instead of a, a research tool, it's going to be a project management tool, so we <laughs> stopped there. Uh, so, any evidence on how this has changed uh, research reports that we work? Is it dead? It changed research reports because we just don't write them. So, you, you, yeah, I'm curious. How, how has that changed the culture? It's uh, for you know anything that happens in my group, we don't write research report. It's really really hard for some people, but we're overcoming that. Um, and instead of writing a research report, if we really have the urge. We just create a playlist. And then uh, if we want to add things that we would have added uh, to a report, we add it as a you know, feature request for Polaris, and, and, and we make that happen if it's really, really needed. Um, that makes us, you know, we ask ourselves very hard questions sometimes. Uh, what is evidence, for example, do we really need, so there was one request uh, to add multiple files as evidence. Mm -hmm. Do we really need three photos that show the same thing from different angles? Not always. Uh, do we need a photo combined with an audio file? Maybe. Um, and so on. But yeah, for uh, anything related to my group, we don't, we don't write research reports. Uh, the hardest thing, by the way, is by you know, when we share that with uh, uh, executives that are used to reading reports. Uh, it's sometimes a process and education is involved in, you know, communicating that this is the report. This playlist, this is the report. That's it. I guess a follow-up question. Yeah. Again. So um, in terms of decision-making, mm -hmm. how do you prevent um, product managers or decision-makers to take what users said at what the community says at face value without like sort of their um, analysis or maybe without checking the golden nuggets that you were mentioning. So uh, I'm sure you know that what users say that 
is the solution to their problem is in many cases not the solution to the problem. So we UXers know that, so we don't even include that in, in, uh, in the nuggets, so they won't see that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a process. This is why we work with these teams. It is a process to teach people and mentor people on how to make sense out of a playlist. And uh, I should say, I mean, even for a, a very basic, um, I don't know, usability test, if you put people in a room or watch videos, whatever, who are not researchers, not UXers, never seen a usability test, they see videos of people using their product. After an hour of watching these, they will have uh, enough information to come up with decisions on what to change in the product, and these will be very good decisions in 99% in of the cases. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about that at all. Okay, one last question. How do you have researchers make, or do you have researchers making you know, the editorial decisions about what's worth putting in? So if you have a study, three out of five, four out of five, or one out of five, run into this, do you pick one that's representative and put that in as a problem and flag it? Do you put all three in combined? What does that look like? Most of the nuggets that go into Polaris are not, of, not coming from studies. They're coming with ongoing conversations and interviews we have with members, mostly with, um, uh, we call them graduating members, with members who decided to leave us. Um, we, we think not because they're pissed at us necessarily, we think this is a good time uh, for us to talk with them because they understand what worked well at WeWork and what worked not so well at WeWork. So this is not a study. This is something we do all the time. And it's, it's, it's almost never a one out of five, two out of five, three out of five thing. That comes to play when you search for, uh, for nuggets and create playlists. So that's the example I gave with the tours and, and, and coffee. Um, you see three nuggets, that's your three. That's it. That's evidence that the only three nuggets about bad coffee, I don't know. Then probably it's not a problem. Um, and um, it's very rarely that we, I mean, not rarely, but we sometimes do these studies, and then we just don't take it as one of the five, the other five. We just look at, let's say, an interview or observation or whatever it is, and we just derive these nuggets, and that's it. And then they go into Polaris, into the ether, and then anyone can search and, and create whatever they want with them. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I just want to end about uh, three minutes before the hour so that there's enough time for interested folks to check out copies of his book behind. So with that, uh, please join me in thanking Toma once again for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks. <laughs> Thanks Toma.